Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Adam Green here with no more news.org. Today is Tuesday, September 15th, 2020. And joining me today, my guest to discuss some troubling, disturbing doctrine in Judaism is Christopher John Bjorkness, author, historian, researcher, expert in Jewish supremacy, has recently done, it's been a few months since I talked to him and had him on, but he did a series on Lurianic Kabbalah, Tikkun Olam, some very interesting, thought-provoking, disturbing um, topics that he was covering. We're going to get into into today with the occult secrets of Judaism revealed. Thank you all for joining me, and thank you for being here, Christopher. Thank you very much for having me. Good to be back. Well, before we get into this uh, deep dive, which we may have to do in a part two as well, um, just just recently, you have been censored. Your life's life's work ba- completely banned from Amazon. Good thing I picked up all of these hard copies now. But uh, tell us about that. Well, uh, perhaps not coincidentally, when I started to reveal the secrets of Lurianic Kabbalah, Amazon contacted me to let me know that they had banned my book, uh, Einstein's Racism Exposed. And they said that they banned it because it was, quote unquote, offensive. And they gave me no particulars beyond that. And according to their own guidelines, offensive cannot be the basis for a ban. And then later they contacted me and said that I had to uh, waive all my rights under the contract and enter into a new contract with them, whereby they would be able to uh, ban me if I did not self-censor based upon unintelligible, quote unquote, guidelines. And I wrote them back and I explained that I can't enter into a new contract with them under duress because they were threatening to ban me. And uh, I cannot be of free mind when I'm being coerced and enter freely into a fair contract. That way I can't even negotiate a contract under those conditions. And I informed them that there could be no meeting of the minds between us because the guidelines that they proposed and asked me to submit to were unintelligible and that no reasonable person could determine from those guidelines what they were prohibiting and what they were not prohibiting. And instead, it only served as an arbitrary and selective basis for them to ban whatever books they want and whatever people they want to ban. And I could not agree to that. Well, and you know, they wrote there was me back and said they had not received my letter and that I was permanently banned and all my books were immediately removed. Yeah, you, you, you made an a interesting point with the, uh, the word Kindle that they use. So it's literally <laughs> Kindle to burn the books from, uh, and I had the Kindles as well so I could search and take the screenshots for the, uh, the two part, I've done two of the three videos, but I did a, based upon your, your series of books here about, uh, the, the mystical aspects of World War II and World War I and the creation and the rebirth of Israel. I did a, a two-part series, the Burnt Offering Atonement Ritual. We're going to get into the Yom Kippur ritual and the scapegoating of the Gentiles today. Um, so check that out in the Can future videos. Can I briefly videos. mention something? Of course. Um, I have some good news. My book... The volume one is back in print. And uh, if people want to get a hard copy, I suggest you grab it right away. I had it up as a PDF and uh, EPUB ebook, and that was censored uh, before an entire day had elapsed. So I don't know how long this print version will last, but if you want a copy, I suggest you grab it immediately. Well, you know, it's funny the the critics would say, oh, your books are allowed on Amazon, so they must not be credible. But uh, they're banned now, so I guess that means that they're automatically credible. I, I'm just kidding, but it just shows the, the faulty logic. Okay, uh, and before we get into the topic today of uh, revealing this disturbing doctrine, I wanted to also touch on 
Uh, you have a BitChute channel, so people go subscribe over there. All the links are down below for your stuff in the description. Let's talk a little bit about this. We've always said metaphorically that Netanyahu and Israel has the keys to the White House and the country, but now it's literally Trump gives over the key to the White House. Not just the key to the White House, but to our country and to our hearts. What are your thoughts uh, on that? My thoughts on that are that Netanyahu, the Chabad Lubavitch movement, and the Israelis view America as Esau and have openly stated so, and that their goal is to use us as their soldiers and their slaves and then to exterminate us. So he is giving the keys to our coffin over to Prime Minister Netanyahu. And we've always known this was the case. Now they're just making it official. It's self-aggrandizing, uh, their political posturing. Trump's always reiterating, this is such a big deal. This is so important. And more keeping, you know, this is make Israel great again. They're spending all their time over in the Middle East with Kushner to build up Israel's geopolitical power. And their, their, uh, their tech and their, their uh, circle of peace, as Netanyahu calls it. Where, where do you think all this is going with the, Abra the Abrahamic software. Accords? The voting, huh? the voting software is a key element that you've raised many times. That's a very dangerous thing for our elections, that he's in bed with Trump and Trump's in bed with him. And the Israelis have control over our election software. Uh, destroys the idea that we are a sovereign nation, an independent people, and a republic which is governed by leaders who are representatives of the people. Instead, we have a subverted government where our leaders are representative of our enemies. And if you listen to uh, Trump's stumping and his rallies and those who speak before his rallies, he always makes a point of bending his knee to Israel. So we do not have representative government. We have subverted and tyrannical government, which is being run by the Israelis. What do you, where do you think this... And they're not ashamed, they're not ashamed to uh, prove it to us, to, to demonstrate it to us. They want us to know it. I know, yeah. Where do you think this Abrahamic Accords and this peace, circle of peace is, is going? Well, the uh, Abrahamic Accord relates to the UAE, the United Arab Emirates. And what people have to know about the United Arab Emirates is that they are a predominantly Sunni Muslim nation. And they are located on the other side of the Straits of Hormuz from Iran. And that is the bottleneck that comes out of the Persian Gulf. So all the oil for Europe is dependent upon that bottleneck. So the UAE gives tremendous leverage to Israel to gin up a war with Iran. Iran is primarily a Shia Muslim nation, and it sits on the other side of the Straits of Hormuz. So we right now have on that bottleneck two uh, enemies pitted against one another, and uh, the UAE is sucking up to Israel and demonstrating the alliance between the Sunni Muslims and Israel. And we see that across the region with Saudi Arabia and increasingly Jordan submitting to Israel in the supposed name of peace, but it is all engineering a war between Sunni and Shia. Shia also sponsors, uh, in large part, Hezbollah, and there's a large Shia bloc within Syria. And what they are doing is they're creating divisions within Islam to pit Muslims against one another, to create a war which will bottleneck oil and send uh, Europe into chaos. Don't they also want to have a Gog and Magog war? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, they're not mutually exclusive. I believe that those things will lead into one another, and they may set up uh, Persia as being the seat of the war 
with uh, one of the Persians serving as Armalus. They also may set it up so that a European serves as Armalus to fight the Battle of Gog and Magog. Interesting. Well, we'll, we'll continue to uh, monitor the Abrahamic Accords, of course, but uh, let, let's get into uh, the topic for this evening. Uh, your series, you did like, I think, six or seven videos on your bit shoot about Lurianic Kabbalah. Um, where would you like to start? Maybe um, the, the part about bribing the devil which they believe is our guardian angel, the, the guardian angel of Esau and the Gentiles. Can you explain that to us in Yom Kippur and this uh, bribing of the devil? Yes. Um, I am increasingly coming to the conclusion and finding evidence and proof for the fact that Kabbalah is essentially the old Canaanite religion and that the Old Testament was the religion of the priest class in the temple. But throughout Israel, there were folk religions, and they had their own temples, and the temples took the form of Canaanite temples, and they had the beliefs of the old Canaanite religion. Now, this belief that there is to be a sacrifice at the temple of two goats, which is stated in Leviticus, I believe chapter 16, and it is discussed in the uh, Babylonian Talmud, I believe in the Tractate Yoma. And in that uh, old practice that they had in the temple, they would find two goats which were identical. And on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, they would offer these goats as sacrifices. And one of the goats would be chosen to be sacrificed to Azazel, Satan, Samael in the wilderness, and the other goat would be sacrificed as part of the uh, sacrificial rites of the temple. And those two goats represent Esau and Jacob, the twin sons of Isaac. And Jacob stole the birthright of Esau. Esau and Jacob were twins, and Esau was born first. And Jacob, as Esau was coming out of the womb, grabbed his heel and tried to pull him back in so that Jacob would be first. But Esau, even the name Esau, means he who is hairy, and it is very similar to the Hebrew word for goat. And the Jews believe that Esau is literally a goat, and not only a goat, but a sacrificial goat. And Jacob is also a sacrificial goat, but Jacob is divine, and Jacob is sacrificed for the rituals of the temple. But Esau, and the goat that represents Esau, has all the sins of the Jews placed on it on the Day of Atonement before it is sent into the wilderness as a gift to Azazel, Samael, Satan. And that is why, that is where the term scapegoat comes from, because the Jews put all of their sins upon this goat and sacrifice it to Satan. And Satan loves sins, so he accepts this goat as a gift. And on that day, Satan stops accusing the Jews of all of their sins to Yahweh. And the uh, Hebrew for ha-Satan in Gematria adds up to 364. And in Kabbalah, they explain that that is so, so that on the 365th day of the year, the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, uh, Satan, Hasetan, stops accusing the Jews of their crimes and instead puts the burden for the entire year's sins onto Gentiles. So whereas these people often claim that they are scapegoated by Gentiles, the reality is, is that they scapegoat Gentiles to Satan for all the sins of Jewry. Now this is also very significant in that we see that um, Esau is a sacrificial animal, literally the sacrificial scapegoat. And not only that, but Esau is scapegoated to Satan. Uh, 
So we can view the world wars and all of the wars which have been instigated, orchestrated, directed, and carried forth by this same group as being manifestations of human sacrifices to Satan. And then perhaps later we can get into the connections between Samael and Jesus and how Christianity to the Jews represents a system whereby Gentiles voluntarily sacrifice themselves to Satan based upon the promise of eternal life. They believe Samael is the guardian angel of Esau, which represents all Gentiles. Talk talk a little bit about the Samael guardian angel. Okay, this again goes back to the Torah and the generations of Noah that are stated in the Old Testament. All the various peoples who are said to derive from Noah, and there are 70 of them. In Kabbalah, they believe in the principle, as above, so below. So each of these 70 nations, Goyim means nations, has princes in the heavens who are their guardian angels. And there is a heavenly government, just as there is to be a government of 70 nations on earth, which the uh, Israelis and Zionists are trying to implement to create a 70 nation council on earth to match the 70 princes in the heavens. That, that's Netanyahu's Samael, circle of peace and, and all the people moving their embassy to Jerusalem. I think that's what they're trying to build with the 70 nations, the 70 Noahide nations. Exactly. Thank you. And Samael is the 71st prince. He is the king of all the princes for the Gentiles, and they call him the guardian angel of the Gentiles so that he is not viewed by the Jews as being a god. They are forbidden to worship him. And that was one of the sticking points of the scapegoat ritual is that it made it appear that they were giving a gift offering, a sacrifice to Satan and therefore were worshiping Samael, Azazel, Satan as a god. And they wanna make it clear that he is a prince and a heavenly guardian angel, but not a god. Now, related to that, the Jews view their gods as multiplicitous gods. They are not monotheistic. They believe in two gods. One of their gods is Yahweh, a male god. And again, this goes back to Canaanite religion. And Yahweh signifies either Baal, the son of El, or El himself. The other god that the Jews worship is Shekinah. Shekinah is their heavenly queen, Yahweh is their heavenly king. Shekinah and Yahweh coupled together into an androgynous being, the Ein Sof. They believe that Shekinah Shekinah and Yahweh used to copulate in the temple and that upon the destruction of the temple, which mirrors the expulsion of Adam and Eve from the Garden of Eden, the Jews were cast out into the diaspora around the world. And they believe that Shekinah became angry with Yahweh at that point and became the guardian of the Jews and follows the Jews around as they are dispersed uh, throughout the world. The Jews want to ingather and rebuild the temple so that Shekinah can then leave their presence and re-enter the temple and again enter into marriage with Yahweh and copulate with Yahweh and restore the androgynous nature of the gods of the Jews. Since Shekinah abandoned Yahweh, the demon spirit Lilith has since become the bride of Yahweh. And they view that as a very bad thing, which has resulted in all of their persecutions since the destruction of the temple. Now, just as Yahweh and Shekinah are the gods of the Jews and are wedded to each other, Lilith and Samael, the demon Lilith, the prostitute goddess, is wedded to Samael. He has four wives. She's one of them. She likes to put uh, demons that she breeds with the nocturnal emissions of men into women and to bear young, to bear demonic young. And Jesus Christ was one of those demonic young 
that Lilith bore. You, you said Lilith Jesus was. Is, Jesus that? was, yes. Uh, w- uh, also, Cain, I thought Cain was the first offspring of Samael and Lilith or, or Eve, correct? Absolutely, and those are very related. If you Google, in Google Images, Moses and serpent, you will see images of a serpent on a cross, and that is Jesus. And that is stated in John chapter 3, verses 14 to 16 where Jesus is promising everlasting life. And it was the serpent in the Garden of Eden who tempted Eve and had sex with Eve and had bore the child Cain, who tempted Eve to eat not only of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, but also of the tree of life. So Jesus, the serpent, has returned to again tempt humanity into biting of the forbidden fruit of the tree of life. And that is why Jesus is portrayed on the cross as the serpent. He was the original serpent in the Garden of Eden. He is Samael to the Jews. And uh, Samael, who they believe is the Gentiles' guardian angel and represents like the head of Satan of the fallen angels, he is also the one that rode the serpent to tempt Eve? He is the serpent who tempted Eve. He oh, is the I, I read different. Had, he's the serpent. I'm quoting from the Talmud. The Talmud has uh, long tracks on this. And the Kabbalah picks up on that theme. Okay, well, I mean, it's it's kind of not that important if he rode the serpent or is the serpent, but it was Samael that tempted Eve. It was also Samael that wrestled with Jacob, and that's how he turned his name to Israel, correct? Israel, yes. And it's also interesting that, so Jacob had the struggle, had the battle with Esau you know, in the, the real world, and then he also wrestled his Esau's guardian angel, Samael, in the celestial realm. That's a novel inside of yours. I hadn't. Oh no, that's what that. that's what I read. I did. I didn't. I, I read that. Also, the guardian angel Samuel is the prince of Rome. How Rome is associated with Edom and Christian West Christianity. Christianity and Armalus. itself. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, uh, Armalus was born of a marble statue in Rome of a beautiful woman that the men would fornicate with, and it produced armalus. Again, that relates to the idea of the fact that Samael and Lilith are breeding with human beings to produce demons. And this all goes back again to the idea, people have to be aware that the Jews are not monotheistic. They believe in the wedding of Yahweh and Shekinah, and that is mirrored for the Gentiles in Samael or Satan and Lilith. Now, this is related to the Canaanite goddess Asherah. Asherah is the goddess of the seas and she is the goddess of prostitutes and is herself a prostitute. And that is why Yahweh calls himself a jealous God because he is jealous of all the fornications of Asherah, whom, who is called uh, Shekinah in Kabbalah. This is mirrored by the prostitute goddess for the Gentiles of Lilith, but the Jews are very careful not to call her goddess. But the Gentiles worship these uh, demons as gods in the form of Jesus Christ and the Virgin Mary. And I just wanted to clarify that that neither Bjorkness or myself, but believe any of this stuff. We're just reporting what they believe. They're disturbing beliefs about Gentiles that have serious consequences if people don't understand what the beliefs that are shaping their attitudes and behaviors. Absolutely. And one of those serious consequences is the fact that they are experimenting with converting our children into androgynous beings through the use of surgery and drugs, toxins. 
and they are imposing this even when the parents object, the courts in some countries, I believe in Canada, are taking custody of the children and forcing this upon them. Now, Kabbalah not only comes from the ancient Canaanite religions, it comes from the original form of Christianity, which is Gnosticism. And the Gnostics also believe that Adam and Eve originally were one being, Adam. And this comes from the idea that Adam was created in God's image. And to the Jews, that means he was created as an androgynous being, because they view Yahweh and Shekinah as coupling together in the Ein Sof as one God. And in the Talmud, it specifies that Adam was born with two faces, one male and one female, and that the female was separated out from Adam. So we have in the beginning the split, which they view as a corruption of the true nature of man and the true nature of their gods. And they believe that the earth and everything else was corrupted 6,000 years ago and that the Torah came about to fulfill the law of repairing all the damage that was done in that corruption. And part of repairing that damage is to make human beings, once again, androgynous beings. And if you, many people may be familiar with the diagram of the Sephirot, which has the 10 rings. Those 10 rings originate in Ophite, diagrams. That's spelled O-P-H-I-T-E. Those O-5 diagrams are Gnostic diagrams. And the whole concept of the 10 Sephirot, the initial 10 emanations of Adam Kadmon, come from the Gnostics and from Canaanite religions. So we see that they, the oral tradition and the Sephirot and everything else comes from Canaanite religions and from Gnosticism. If you can pull up a diagram, a good diagram of the Sephirot, uh, S-E-P-H-I-R-O-T in Google Images, I can explain many things about that diagram and what it means. Isn't this it? At, that's it. At the very top, you have the crown. At the very bottom, you have the kingdom. Everything on the right-hand column, as we look at it, looking at the right-hand column, is male. Everything on the left is female. The crown on the top is Adam Kadmon. The, the uh, lower crown is the kingdom, which is Shekinah. So we are moving from Adam Kadmon through history, through 6,000 years, to the kingdom of Shekinah which is why they are now trying to foist female leadership on us, because we are supposed to enter the feminine age where Shekinah rules. If you look at the diagram, uh, can you pull it back and center it? No, I can't the very center top it, no. three, well, just so that we can see everything. The very top three form a trinity. So you have the male on the right, the female on the left, and the middle is the androgynous unity. And that's where the concept of the Trinity comes from. You have Shekinah, the Holy Spirit, which is the female. You have Yahweh, the male. And then you have them combined as the Ein Sof, which is androgynous. Now, the Kabbalists also view that first top male thing as being the sun, and that could be viewed as Jesus Christ. And there is a mirror sephirot for Gentiles. And in that sephirot, you would have Samael on the right and Lilith on the left, and the top would be androgynous. So we have those first top three sections representing the first 2,000-year period of existence, which begins with Adam and creation. In dispensationalism, which is Kabbalistic Christianity, that represents the first dispensation of the patriarchs, the age of the patriarchs. In astrology, that represents the 2,000-year period of the age of Taurus. 
we now move down to the next two, three, the next trinity in the middle. And that represents the age of Aries, which in dispensationalism is the age of the Jews. We now move down to the third trinity. That represents the age of Pisces, which is Christianity, which is why Jesus is represented as a fish. So the Sephirot moves as a historical process of restoration towards the very bottom, which is Shekinah, the kingdom. And that is the Sabbath, the 7,000th year, when the world is to rest, when the temple is to be rebuilt, when the Messiah is to rule, and when Shekinah and feminine principles are to govern and completely androgynous mankind, when androgyny has been restored. So the androg- androgynous Adam, and then I saw you cover this in your series, and I just came across this and sent it to you the other day. I thought this was quite interesting. This uh, early Christian writing, the apocryphal texts, where is it? The Greek Gospel of the Egyptians. This is the, what is it? The Hagamadi, Nag Hammadi scrolls. Listen, look Nag at this. Nag Hammadi, yes. The Greek the Gospel. Gnostic scrolls that were found in Egypt. It says here that the content of it, shoot, we can draw off and draw. It was that part about Salome. The return, the theme of the book is the return to an androgynous state before the, the messianic. In the end times. In the end times, yes. And now we're seeing transgenderism, LGBTQ, just exploding, being popularized and pushed in the media. And we know the effects that this is having. Young children are exposed to this. They, uh, they mimic what they do. This is being made trendy and promoted heavily. YouTube promotes it heavily. And this is where you think it's coming and from. We this also is have the fact Sh- that the temple, uh-huh. the temple uh, used to have prostitutes who were homosexuals, and would try to lure people in. Another aspect of these Gnostic beliefs that went all the way down through the Cathars is the idea that putting the spirit of a soul into a material body is evil and that the androgynous state is superior because then females will stop giving birth to children. So it is a program for the extermination of the human race, which is why the Roman Catholic Church put down the Cathars. Because if the whole of Europe had followed the beliefs of these Gnostics, there would have been no more children born. And uh, the Gnostics used to consume semen and menstrual waste because they believe they contain divine spirits and they would perform abortions because they did not want the spirits to be trapped in material form in human bodies. That is another one of the agendas that we have going on sponsored by these Kabbalists is the uh, huge numbers of abortions. Lilith is a child murderer. She's very jealous of normal human children. She instead wants to put in surrogate demons into the wombs of humans and breed those demons. So she would come and slaughter the children of uh, normal human children. So this is also part of the Kabbalistic agenda is to genocide our children through abortion and through making human beings androgynous. They view procreation as evil in contradiction to Genesis, where it says, go forth and multiply. So they are saying that the law of Genesis has been fulfilled across these 6,000 years. And this old world is to end, and a new world is to begin, and the new world is to be perfected. I'd like to explain what they mean by tikkun olam and uh, rectifying the destruction of the original vessels of the Sephirot. Tikkun olam means restoring the world. Why does the world need restoration? In uh, Kabbalistic ontology, 
the world was created by the Ein Sof, the limitless light, contracting itself in order to create a void which could then be filled with creation. When that happened, there was a projection of light into that void, which split into the ten sephirot, which are the manifestations of the divine uh, limitless light in the void that became Adam Kadmon. Ein Sof then entrapped those ten emanations in vessels. Seven of those vessels fell and shattered. And that is what introduced Tohu and Bohu into the world, which in Genesis is chaos and void. In Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, they believe that Gentiles are part of those broken shards of vessels and are evil shells entrapping divine sparks. In order to restore those vessels which were shattered in creation, Gentiles have to be exterminated to remove the evil shells. When that happens, there is again void which can be filled by light. So the process of tikkun olam is the process of fulfilling the 613 mitzvot of Maimonides and includes the extermination of the Amalekites. In exterminating Gentiles, they get rid of that darkness in order to make room for the light. And that again refers back to Genesis, where chaos and void give way to light. And it is the Holy Spirit which hovers upon the waters, which brings about this process of creation. That Holy Spirit is the sea goddess Asherah of the Canaanites, who becomes Shekinah in Kabbalah. I just wanted to uh, emphasize that we know that the average Jewish person probably has no idea about any of this stuff. This is deep, Kabbalistic, Hasidic, esoteric knowledge, but nonetheless, this is incredibly supremacist, dangerous, genocidal um, doctrine here that we're going over. And, you know, I discovered... And it's the Mm it's the governing principles that our rulers are using. Mm -hmm. And I believe at the Democratic uh, National Convention, there was a nun, a Catholic nun, who gave one of the prayers for the convention. And I suspect she may have been giving one of these Kabbalistic prayers to Shekinah because she prayed to the Holy Spirit and discussed those initial passages, the first paragraph of Genesis, in very Kabbalistic terms. It, and this is so interesting because when I first discovered Jacob and Esau, I uh, I was blown away because the the importance of that story and the implications of it today and how it explains almost everything. It doesn't start with Jacob and Esau. That's just like the one of the latest uh, incarnations. Which, by the way, they believe in reincarnation. So they believe Gentiles and the darkness and evil was created when the shattered the vessels were shattered. That's the origin of evil. That's where there's the two atoms, the, 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 the Jewish atom and then the Gentile atom. And then it goes on to explain us uh, the origin story with Lilith and Samael and, and having Cain and how Cain and Abel is also uh, the same story basically as Jacob and Esau. This is all explained in the Zohar. And this is what the Zoharites believe, the uh, Hasidic Jews, the Kabbalists, any Orthodox Jew who practices Kabbalah, uh, they probably, most of them aren't aware of it. And Jews are traditionally discouraged from studying Kabbalah until they reach age 40, but among the Hasidic, it's pervasive. It goes all the way back to the origins of creation, the tohu and bohu, chaos and void. The, um, the Zohar explains that Esau derives from tohu and bohu, and that in order to restore the world, tohu and bohu, chaos and void, have to be purged, have to be eliminated so that the light can refill the vacuum which was created when the Ein Sof 
contracted. Samael is the guardian angel, the prince, the 71st prince of the princes in heaven of the Gentiles. Lilith is one of his brides. Lilith likes to breed demons with human beings. Samael is the serpent who entered the Garden of Eden and seduced Eve and fornicated with Eve in the Garden of Eden to produce the child Cain. The child Cain is the ancestor of Esau. Esau is the ancestor of the Amalekites, Hagag, and Haman. These are the people who have to be exterminated in order for the messianic era to commence. So yes, it goes far back beyond Esau. And all of these people, all Gentiles, are of the seed of Samael from that initial copulation between Eve and Adam in the Garden of Eden. Another interesting belief they have about Adam is that he fornicated with all of the animals in the garden before he discovered that he could sleep with Eve, and then he preferred Eve to fornicating with the animals. So that the Jews believe that in some way this seed of the beasts became part of the seed of Gentiles, but not of Jews. Another story is that Adam, for 130 years, uh, did not sleep with Eve and slept with all other manner of beings. Now, there are two Adams for the Jews, and this is uh, distinguished from Adam Kadmon, who in Lurianic Kabbalah is anthropomorphic and takes the form of a man, but is not the Adam, the biblical Adam. The biblical Adam, again, just as Samael and Lilith are Gentile mirror images of Yahweh and Shekinah, there is a Gentile mirror image of the original Adam. The original Adam for the Jews is Adam Ahelion, the supreme man. And he had within him all the souls of the Jews at once. And those souls were both male and female. They were androgynous. And the Jews in the Zohar refer to them as the twin souls. So their objective is to restore the twin soul nature of all the Jews. The Gentiles derive from a different Adam, Adam Belial, which means the wicked man or the unnecessary man. And by unnecessary, they mean that all the souls that were contained in Adam Belial must be eliminated from existence in order to make room for the Ein Sof to again fill the vacuum with divine light. So by calling uh, Gentiles and their Adam wicked and unnecessary, that is their intent. Their intent is extermination. And just to reiterate the magnitude of this, it's so hypocritical that they're always crying about blood libel when they literally believe that all non-Jews are born impure, the epitome of all evil. And this is Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs. This is his article here. The seed of Satan. The seed of Satan, yes. It's important to point out the seed of Satan, and they are the seed of the divine sparks. This, this Gentiles is, are the corruption, the broken vessels, the shells, satanic. I'm sorry, I interrupted. This is Rabbi Sachs, where he he talks about everything you just explained with the Yom Kippur scapegoat sacrifice, how that represents Esau, how they send off the the goat, the Esau goat with the red uh, string around it, which you know that's Kabbalah, the red string. Azazel, the mysterious place or entity which the goat was intended, was Samael. Esau's guardian angel. They think, they just openly think that our guardian angel is Satan. But they yes, believe also and that they that, give their sins as a gift to Satan who places that burden on Gentiles. So Gentiles are hated by Yahweh as sinners, and Jews are viewed by Yahweh as perfectly pure. Mm -hmm. So they are condemning Gentiles to damnation, to hell, 
with Satan. And the more the Jews sin, the worse it is for Gentiles because Gentiles absorb all the sins of the Jews through this ritual sacrifice of the goat to Satan. It's very important to understand that before the Jews send the goat out to Azazel, Samael, Satan, they place all of the sins of all of the Jewish people onto that goat. The other goat is pure then, and the Jews are then pure. And on that 365th day, the Jew, that's why they call it the ritual of atonement. The Jews have atoned because the Gentiles absorb all of those sins, and the Gentiles are condemned to hell. Well, the Jews are given the blessing of Yahweh as pure and divine beings, even though they are evil or all the evil that they commit is then passed on to the Gentiles. Another interesting thing, you mentioned that red ribbon. Uh, the red ribbon on the goat that was to be used in the temple ritual, I think it was placed on the gate, and it would turn white most times when the goat that was sent into the wilderness was successfully killed and sacrificed to Azazel. They would push that goat off a cliff with a rope around its neck, which would hang it and snap its neck as it fell down the cliff and tumbled and got ripped to shreds. Now that would happen far away from the temple. How would the temple know that the ritual had been successfully performed? Tradition holds that they would know because the red ribbon would turn white. Now, right at the time that the temple was about to be destroyed and Jesus Christ was sacrificed, the Talmud states that that uh, red ribbon would no longer turn white and the sacrifice failed at that point. And we then had the destruction of the temple and the end of all animal sacrifices so that those who want to continue to sacrifice the goat have to sacrifice Esau. Literally, human beings have to be sacrificed for the Yom Kippur and the atonement of Jewry. And the implications of this, that they think that we're all born evil as Esau, hating them for no reason, also it teaches the Jacob-Esau story that they can uh, deceive it's us? It's not for no reason. It's not for no reason. That's the reason. That's the reason given in the Bible mm -hmm. that um, Esau was angry with Jacob for deceiving him by giving him porridge in exchange for his birthright after sending him out to hunt so that he would come back hungry and then he would give him red lentil porridge. Again, Edom and Esau are red. He had red hair. And Jacob tricked him in that way to surrendering his birthright. The other way that Jacob tricked him is Rebecca, their mother, told Jacob to put goat skin on his arms. Isaac was blind and he felt Esau's arms and uh, felt Jacob's arms, felt that they were covered with goat skin and hairy and therefore believed that it was Esau. Esau was first born, so Isaac wanted to give Esau his blessing. But Jacob tricked him and inherited the blessing in that way by deceiving Isaac into believing that he was Esau because he had the hair of what animal? The hair of a goat. Who is that goat? That goat is the scapegoat that the Jews put all of their sins on and sacrificed to Satan. It also says here that uh, Samael is a patron of Edom which also represents Esau. And here's the kicker. Here's the crazy part. God, according to the treatise, God castrated Samael in order to not fill the world with their demonic offspring. He's talking about Esau. They're talking about Gentiles. They castrated Samael and then mix in the androgynous aspect as well. And you could see why we're seeing all of this. Uh, you know, you and I did a whole video up on BitChute. It's, it's on No More News dot org uh, featured videos about Jewish sexuality. We get into some of their sexuality beliefs, eight genders in the Talmud as well. Um, this relates to Greek mythology, the mythology of Cronus and Uranus. You can find uh, paintings by Goya and I think Rubens of uh, Cronus eating his children, devouring his children. 
the castration relates to that uh, thing where uh, he castrates him so he can no longer uh, bear children to consume. And that is the symbol of communism, the sickle. Kronos is Saturn. The Jews have the symbol of the sickle as the symbol of communism to represent that castration. And that is why they have the castration of Samael to mirror those uh, ancient Greek myths of Kronos as Saturn. The other symbol of communism is the hammer. And the hammer is the hammer of Judah Maccabee. And it is the hammer by which they smashed and committed genocide against the Greeks because the Hellens had a superior culture. Ancient Jews began to assimilate into Hellenistic culture and the Maccabees wanted to ensure that that not happen. So they committed genocide against the Greeks, which they celebrate with the menorah and the festival of Hanukkah. So just, just so you can see that, they, that some of them seriously believe this, they believe that Gentiles have a guardian angel, satanic demon, Samael. Here is... Uh, the Satan. The Satan. The Satan. I, I've also it seen the, the head of Satans as well. But here we go. This is him literally believing that Gentiles are evil, impure, and surrounded by demons. Why are the nations, why are the Goim, the idol worshippers, why are they Mezoamim? What's Mezoamim? Mezoamim means they're impure. Their natural state is being impure. A Goy's natural state is impurity. What does impurity mean? Impurity means that if you had real glasses that were going to be able to tell you all of the things that are really next to you, your world will be very different than your world right now. Right now you see each other, you see me, that's all you see. But the real world is very different than what we see. And the reason why we don't see it is because if we really saw all of the Shadim and the, 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 the angels, the good ones, the bad ones, the, the, and so on, that are really next to us, we'd lose our mind. But the Goim, they have a certain level of Tum'ah that is constantly next to them. Constantly next to them. Constantly inside them. Does that make them bad people? Not always. Not always. Sometimes. But it's always the case. Why is it always the case? The Gemara asks. Why? Why do they have this Mizuami? Why? Are we racist now? We have nothing else to do in the world to be racist against Goim. There's 8 billion of them. Find a different hobby. Pick on somebody your own size. N- note the supremacist mindset that that their size is larger than us, that we're too easy to even pick on? You could also interpret that interpret that to mean that he's afraid that the Jews are outnumbered, and if they're doing this, there's going to be a retaliation, and they're mm-hmm. worried, so uh, they don't want to pick on an enemy who outnumbers them so greatly. So we have the shattered vessels, we have... The Adam, uh, Kadmom, the, the bad one is, is Belial, the two Adams, Helion and Belial. Yes, Adam Belial is the Adam who contained all the souls of the Gentiles. Adam Helion, which is the supreme man, is the Adam that contained all the souls, the twin souls of the Jews. And this, this is like a Jewish dualism. Their explanation, uh, the Kabbalist mysticism explanation of evil made by the Kabbalists. Treatment of the problem of evil. Uh, Excuse me? The Jews view uh, evil as a product of their gods, so that evil is therefore good. And they believe that they can derive good from evil. Uh, The Zohar tells a story about a king who had an only son whom he loved very much. And he wanted to test that son, so he had a prostitute try to seduce that son. And the son rejected the prostitute. So they believed that the good of that son being a noble son was manifested through the evil of the seductress prostitute. And in Isaiah, 
and also in Job, I think 20, 29, something like that, uh, it says that evil comes from God, everything comes from God, and therefore uh, evil is good, and the Jews are fully entitled to engage in evil and to utilize evil because everything comes from their gods. And they believe that the divine evil, Esau's persecutory agent, is actually what uh, is needed to keep Judaism and to keep them in line and to punish them for their transgressions of not following the commandments. Can you, can you elaborate on that a bit? Where evil is actually good, like the Rebbe said about uh, the H word in World War II? Yes, because it maintains the absolute segregation. It keeps them segregated from Gentiles. If uh, Esau hates Jacob, Gentiles uh, segregate and separate from Jews, which preserves them. And they believe that also, as you said, that Esau is an agent of their gods to persecute them, and then they obtain the uh, good of atonement. And they ultimately. And this is a recurring theme throughout the Old Testament that the wives of the Gentiles seduced uh, Jewish men into worshiping other gods and causing impure blood. This was one of Ezra's uh, chief complaints was that the Jews were marrying uh, non-Jews, and you had the mixed multitude with Moses. And again and again, it's a theme. And you had Solomon marrying foreign wives and engaging in the worship of foreign gods, and that's why his temple was destroyed. And he built his temple with uh, demons and angels, and demons and angels of the 70 princes of the generations of Noah. So what does this mean for the future? Jacob, Esau, Ishmael, they say that's the Gog and Magog war. Uh, what's going to happen to Esau? Or what do they believe is going to happen in the end times with, with Esau or, um, yeah, I guess just Esau or Edom? They believe that they will restore the world by eliminating Esau from existence. Don't they have to, isn't there an aspect, um, excuse me, isn't there an aspect of Esau that is going to repent and become a Noahide and help them rebuild the temple as well? Perhaps, perhaps, but you also have the aspect of the judgment of the nations, which is stated again and again in Psalms, where the Messiah has the right, and in Jeremiah, and in Nehemiah, and in Obadiah, and basically throughout the Old Testament, you have this idea that the uh, the Messiah will engage in judgment of the Gentiles. And he will, after judging the Gentiles, I believe the plan is to exterminate the Gentiles. The only way the Jews can ever ensure that a Jew uh, not bear children with the Gentiles is to eliminate the Gentiles. And that's the ultimate goal of Judaism, is to ensure that the divine blood never mix with the satanic blood of Esau. The only guarantee for that would be to eliminate Esau from existence. And the only way to repair the world would be to eliminate Esau from existence. The Ein Sof cannot fill the void when the satanic seed of Esau is present. It's not simply a religious and belief aspect. Converting uh, Gentiles to Noahides does not eliminate the blood of Samael. It's just... Mind-boggling that there's so many Christians in America that just love Israel and and look to the Jews that if they're they don't bless them they're cursed. Meanwhile, Judaism teaches that we've got a satanic guardian angel and that we're only here on earth to serve them. That the elder shall serve the younger. Esau shall serve Jacob because they stole our birthright and they take pride in this. The deception of of Esau. And is this, I saw this from Edras, I think second Edras, for Esau is the end of the world and Jacob is the beginning of it that followeth. Tell me about that. Yes, that I pointed that out in one of my videos. Second Edras um, states in chapter six that um, the end of the world will come and will only come when Esau is purged from the world that they have to exterminate Esau in order to bring about the end of the old world and the beginning of the new world. 
And in Isaiah, it talks about the uh, death of the old earth and the, the new earth to come. And the new earth to come is to be devoid of Esau. And it goes further down and talks about how Esau is spittle. And it mentions those vessels which became the vessels of the Sephirot in uh, Kabbalah. So, yeah, it talks about... When it the, says the, that a drop of spittle falls from the vessel. That vessel is one of the seven sephirot that shatters in Kabbalah. And this is the verse, Isaiah 40, 15. Behold the nations. So that's the goyim nations. Goyim means nations. So the Gentile nations are as a drop of a bucket and are counted as the small dust of the balance. So the little bit of dust left over on the scale. Behold, he taketh... Up the aisles as a very little thing. But again, you have to understand that for the Jews, the Gentiles are shells, the evil shells that broke off from the vessels when the vessel shattered. And the, the analogy is made to uh, if you had a giant clay vessel or pot containing olive oil and it shattered, there would be a tiny portion of oil that stuck to each one of the shards of the vessel. And that oil would be the sparks of divine light. So the Jews believe that the process of tikkun olam is the process of sweeping away the shards, the shells which cover up the darkness, which covers up the light. So Esau is those shells and is that darkness and has to be eliminated in order to make way for the light. We've also again, read in the all Tal this predate the, the Kabbalah didn't come about until the uh, 1200s. This second Esdras is very early Christian and probably large parts of it predate Christianity. So we see that Kabbalah was not something new. It was the oral tradition, which was Canaanite religion. All of this idea of the creation myth of Kabbalah is actually Canaanite beliefs. So I believe what happened, and I'm not the only one who believes this, and I'm not the first one who believes this. Well, I, I am uh, original in ass assigning this to the oral tradition, is that there were folk Jewish religions throughout the land of Canaan, and they practiced the old Canaanite religion. They worshiped Moloch, they sacrificed their uh, firstborn children, etc., etc. All those things in the Bible which are condemned as Baal worship was probably what the majority of Jews were doing. And that this uh, carried on as the oral tradition. And some of the priests condemned it and wrote down the Torah, which is the written tradition. But the oral tradition was the actual beliefs of the majority of Jews, and the rabbis preserved it. And there were rabbis throughout Canaan, throughout Palestine, who preserved all of this and then immediately wrote it down in the form of Christianity, and then immediately after that in the form of the Midrash, and then they added the Gemara to the Midrash to produce the Talmud. And that was how all of these Canaanite beliefs started to get written down. And then later, uh, another man fabricated the Zohar and created Kabbalah. But I suspect that he had access to many Gnostic scrolls because of the affinity between Gnosticism and Kabbalah. And I think they were simply reviving the Canaanite religion in the form of Gnosticism that became Kabbalah. And now as we discovered the Qumran and we discovered the Nag Hammadi, we can see that all of these Kabbalistic doctrines which were referred to in some of the writings against the heretics that were produced by the early church fathers, were, had to have been known by the Kabbalists. And they probably preserved these uh, texts from the Gnostic tradition on down, and they probably still have them. And many of their symbols probably relate to all of this. And that's another thing that reveals that uh, Jesus is the serpent. One of the old Gnostic symbols of Jesus is Abraxas, A-B-R-A-X-A-S, Abraxas. If you Google image that, you'll get pictures of him. And he has legs, which are serpents. 
That image of Abraxas is again the Kabbalistic idea of male and female. His legs represent the Osoboros, the male and the female of an androgynous god. In the Ouroboros, you have the head of the snake on the left. That is the female of the Sephirot. That is Shekinah. Shekinah is consuming the male, the phallic symbol of the tail of the snake, which is Yahweh. When the Ouroboros consumes its tail, it forms a ring, like the rings of the Sephirot, the divine emanations. It becomes an androgynous being, the male and the female in one. And that is also symbolized by Samael and Lilith, who takes the form of the ancient symbol of Abraxas. How do you spell it again? A, B? A is in Abraham, mm -hmm. B is in boy, R is in Ron, A is in Abraham, X as in X-ray, A, S. Abrax S. Whoa. <laughs> That is what uh, Baphomet was crafted out of. Yeah, Alethius Baphomet is Lehi. androgynous as well. Yes, and Alephius Levy, well, that's a... Um, it's a cute little fellow the there. Look at that course. pop. Look at the tail tied up. This is what you're talking about. Yes, that one and uh, the ones where you see the two legs as snakes. Now, those two legs as snakes can rise up above his head and become horns. And when they do that, they form the Baphomet that Alephius Levy uh, concocted in the 1800s. See how the horn is actually the heads of the two snakes, mm -hmm. which are his legs and the rooster's head? That is Abraxas. That was the original Gnostic symbol for Jesus Christ. And it has breasts. Uh, the famous uh, huh? psychologist, Jung, wore a ring that had a symbol of Abraxas on it. That's amazing. Oh, and it so is amazing. The, uh, mm -hmm. They have tricked. Gentiles into worshiping Satan in the form of Jesus Christ. And I suspect they were aware of it from the beginning. Even in John, it states that Jesus is the symbol of the serpent. In uh, John uh, chapter 3, verses 14 to 16. You could even pull that up if you want. Oh, I am. John 3, 14 through 16. Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness. The son of man must be lifted up who believes eternal life. Uh, I don't know. By that, they're referring. Oh, absolutely. That's, that's not controversial, Adam. Again, look up Moses and serpent, and you'll see the serpent on the cross. That's what he means by the son of man must be lifted up. That means crucified. Just as Moses placed the brazen serpent on the cross to chase off the uh, snakes, which were cursing the Israelites. So Jesus Christ must be lifted up like that snake. And the original Ophites, O-P-H-I-T-E-S, worship Jesus as a serpent. Is this what it's called? Nehushtan? Yes. Hearing the Israelite of snake bites. Okay, um, I want to shift gears back to uh, Yom Kippur a little bit. Why do they have to take out their sins on chickens and on the Gentiles? How do they think that's moral to get rid of their sins, cleanse their sins, atone and redeem their sins by putting them, by bribing our satanic guardian angel? It just sounds too crazy to be real. Because that way they get away with it. That way they are no longer burdened with sin and are divine. It's like um, uh, reaping the rewards of all their sins. They get to keep everything they steal, and their God isn't angry with them because Satan no longer accuses them of having stolen. 
So it is, um, it's a process of indemnification for all the evil that they want to do. It no longer becomes evil because they're cleansed. Again, you have to understand that they don't function on individual conscience. That's a Christian concept, an Augustinian concept. And I think the Muslims also have it, that uh, everyone is born with a conscience and that you feel bad when you commit sin. They view view committing sin as simply breaking the law, but they believe they can get away with breaking the law because they can burn with Gentiles and chickens and whatever else they want to sacrifice, literally murder, as a sacrifice to Satan. And therefore, the sin no longer exists for them. It's instead a sin that's placed on the Gentiles, and the Gentiles get punished for it. That's what a scapegoat is. That's why the term scapegoat arose. And it's so hypocritical that they always say that we scape, scapegoat them for everything. When oh, this it's is beyond the, his. When this is their it's belief. It's insanely hypocritical. <clears throat> the scapegoat is, some, is a mythology that they created in order to burden Gentiles with their sins so that Gentiles would be punished by their guardian angel, who is Satan. And again, this is not controversial. You'd be able to find all kinds of sources which uh, state exactly that, that the sins of Jacob are placed on the goat, which signifies Esau, and are given to Azazel, who is Samael, Satan. Incredible. We should uh, question some rabbis on this. I'd like to get some rabbis' answers. How do you get off on thinking that we have a satanic guardian angel? And that we're Esau and Edom, and Edom needs to be destroyed in the end times. And anybody that opposes them and doesn't want to serve them as a Noahide is going to be Amalek, who they have to destroy in their end times. Uh, explain uh, a little bit about but Islam. But you don't understand. Rabbis are entitled to lie to you about it. Mm-hmm. The, um, the Talmud specifies that they can lie to non-Jews, and they are prohibited from revealing their secrets to Gentiles. So it would be a fruitless discussion because, again, they can lie to you without sin because part of their law grants them the right to lie to you, and they can lie in Gentile courts. And you are to be killed if you uh, delve into their books. Mm -hmm. I think it's in Sanhedrin Folio 59 where it says that uh, those who look into their Torah and their books are to be killed. Right. Yeah, I've seen that confirmed. So I see this Abrahamic Accords that Trump and and uh, Netanyahu and Kushner are all doing. I see this as uniting the Abrahamic religions and and trying to rebuild the temple under the Noahide laws. Um, give us a little bit about uh, how Christianity and Islam in regards to Noahide laws. Um, The Jews believe that Christianity through James was a commandment given to Paul to convert Gentiles into Noahides, and that um, James instructed Paul that Gentiles were to follow these prescriptions uh, that were given to Noah and even to Adam to kill animals in humane ways and to obey, to have just laws and to worship the one God and that Christians are Noahides, which essentially makes them the slaves of Jews, and then they go around destroying their own pagan gods, which destroys all the supernatural protection that the Gentiles have. And in effect, what they're doing is they are destroying their own guardian angels, the 70 princes in heaven, and as above, so below. If the jealous God of the Jews can kill off the 70 princes in heaven, then the Jews, who are the divine manifestation on earth, will have an easy time killing off the 70 nations of the Gentiles on earth because they will have no divine protection, no guardian angels. So by converting the 70 Gentile nations to Christianity, what they have really done is they have eliminated and killed off their 70 guardian angels. So Gentiles are now unprotected by supernatural forces, and the Jews therefore have an easy time manipulating Gentiles and exterminating Gentiles. Well, don't they believe that um, Samael is our guardian angel? 
it is a court in the heavens on the seven planets. Each of the seven planets has ten of the princes of the Gentiles. Samael is the 71st who overrules that court of the 70 princes. But the 70 princes are also guardian angels. There's not a single guardian angel to answer your question. Each individual has guardian angels. And in the Talmud, it explains that every living being, every animal, plant, human being, etc., has a guardian angel. Now, what the Jews do through the process of miscegenation also eliminates the guardian angels because the Jews say that when you crossbreed species or mix races, that it confuses the guardian angels of each of those individuals and nations and kills them off. So many of the things that they are doing is to eliminate the supernatural protection that Gentiles have so that they can both satisfy the demands of their jealous God so that no gods in the heavens are worshipped and then those gods perish. And likewise, Gentiles on earth will perish because they will no longer have the guardian angels and their pagan gods to defend them in the heavens. In the ancient world, and this is uh, proven by the writings of Cyprian and many other ancient authors, peoples would believe that their gods would protect them in times of war. And that when one nation conquered another nation, that nation would boast that it got, its gods were superior because its gods enabled them to defeat the gods of the other nations. And that there would be heavenly battles between the gods just as there were earthly battles between peoples. And so the Jews are waging both the heavenly, and, as above so below, both the heavenly battles and the earthly battles by converting Gentiles to Islam and Christianity. The Jews believe that it, Islam was created in order to make Noahides of the Muslims and superior Noahides to the Christians, and that the Muslims would eventually conquer the Christians, and that would come very close to converting all of humanity into Noahides. And you'll notice that in the um, Noahide laws of the Talmud, in the tractate Sanhedrin, folios 56 to 60, it states that Christians are to be beheaded. And one of the things that we see Muslims doing consistently through history is beheading Christians. So Muslims are fulfilling the Noahide laws in their attacks on Christians. And the Jews believe that their golden age was when they lived under Muslims, under Muslim rule. And the Jews repeatedly opened the gates of Europe to the Muslims at Toledo, and they opened the gates um, to Constantinople, they opened the gates to Jerusalem, to invading uh, Muslim hordes again and again, so that the Muslims would slaughter the Christians. Explain to us a little bit about the <clears throat> the two Moshiachs and Netanyahu possibly playing the figure, the role of the first Moshiach, Ben, ben Yosef, uh, and, and touch on the Rebbe and handing the keys over to Moshiach, that stuff, if you could. Uh, in the Old Testament book of Isaiah, in chapter 11, verses 1 through 10, it talks about... Uh, Moshiach ben David, the Moshiach who's going to be the king who rules over Israel and is descended from King David. And it also talks about that in Psalm um, chapter 72, verses 1 to 19, and throughout Psalms. And then in chapter 53, it talks about the suffering Messiah, who is Moshiach ben Yosef. Uh, Moshiach, the son of Joseph. Moshiach, the son of Joseph, is to be the warring Moshiach who clears away all the Gentile nations in the battle of Gog and Magog and exterminates the Gentiles. And then Moshiach ben David, Moshiach, uh, Messiah son of David, is to be the Messiah who rules in peace as the governmental king over Israel and judges whatever Gentiles are left, if there are any left. So uh, Messiah, son of Joseph, is the warrior king, and Messiah, um, 
son of David, is the ruling political king. In Christianity, we see Jesus' first coming as fulfilling uh, Isaiah chapter 53, which talks about the suffering Messiah. And Jesus suffered and bore the lashes and the scourges and um, thereby cleansed the sins of humanity as a human sacrifice. And he is to re return as uh, Messiah, son of David, to be to rule over the kingdom, that the kingdom is to be a kingdom in heaven and not a kingdom in Israel. Do you think they could be setting the stage, following the script to play Netanyahu as Moshiach ben Joseph, and then somebody that follows after him, Moshiach ben David? Absolutely. I think that is the script that they're following. I think he is uh, destined to have a battle with Armelus, and he will be killed. Moshiach ben Yosef, uh, Messiah son of, David, uh, of Joseph, is to be killed in a battle with the Persian king. And then, um, then Moshiach ben David will be the, the ruler of the conquering forces who vindicate Moshiach ben Yosef. That story is told in uh, Sefer Zerubbabel, and there are passages in the Zohar which discuss it, the battle with the Persians and the fact that Moshiach ben Yosef will be killed. Can we uh, back it up a little bit? Can you explain to us uh, Lurianic Kabbalah a bit? And then, and then we may take a couple questions uh, and wrap it up at about an hour and a half. Uh, Lurianic Kabbalah is the cosmological conception that prior to creation, there was a limitless light, the Ein Sof. And that limitless life determined to manufacture creation in its image. And in order to do that, it had to contract part of itself. And that shows the loving nature of the Ein Sof, that it was willing to contract part of itself in order to manifest creation. The next cosmological process was for emanations of this divine light to enter that vacuous space, which was created by its contraction. Uh, Luria took that Kabbalistic concept a step further and said that there were these 10 emanations were contained in vessels, that something went awry in this process. And seven of these 10 vessels, each of which uh, can, um, embodies the, uh, the nature of the divine in the form of knowledge, love, art, etc. Seven of them shattered. And when they shattered, they introduced uh, tohu and bohu, um, chaos and void, into the world that has to be repaired. But they also released the divine sparks of the Jewish people whose souls were born through Adam the Helion. And the souls of the Gentiles were born through this corruption in the form of Adam Belial. It becomes a burden upon the chosen people to restore the earth. And they have 6,000 years in which to do it. And there will be two uh, three 2,000-year epics which align with the astrological ages. Those ages have expired, and it was the burden of the Jews to go around by following the law of the Torah, the 613 mitzvot, to repair all of this chaos and disorder so that at the end of those 6,000 years, the Torah and all the law of the Jews will be fulfilled. At that point, the restoration will include the elimination of Gentiles and everything that is evil. And we also have the belief that only Jerusalem was created by the divine and the rest of the earth 
was created by Samael. And that may be why they are committing so much environmental damage, because they view the rest of that creation as being satanic, and only Jerusalem as being holy. But I digress. So at the culmination of that 6,000 years, we have moved down the Sephirot from the crown to the kingdom, and the 7,000th year in the age of Aquarius, the ages of Taurus, Aries, and Pisces, being the ages of the patriarchs, the Jews, and the Christians, have now expired, and it is now time for Shekinah to dominate. So males will have to give way to females, and human beings will have to become like the original Adam who was created in the image of the androgynous God, and human beings will have to become androgynous in order for the 7,000 years to commence. And they will utilize science to fulfill this Kabbalah to create these immortal androgynous beings, and there will no longer be birth and death. Instead, each individual will be both male and female and immortal. And I think that sums up what uh, Luriana Kabbalah is. And we can get into Shekinah and Yahweh and how they're married and fornicate in the temple and all that, but I think we've covered Did Did Luriana Kabbalah change the, the doctrine about the the Moshiach or the the Messiah? Yes, Luriana Kabbalah placed the burden of being the Messiah on the Jewish people through the process of tikkun olam of restoring the world, so that the Jewish people as a whole would create the restoration that was traditionally attributed to the Messiah, and they would prepare the way for the Messianic age. So it was a burden upon the Jewish people to kill off the Gentiles, to get rid of all Gentile governments, to destroy all of the uh, monarchies, the princes and the kings and the queens. All of that traditionally in the Torah and in traditional Kabbalah and Talmud was to ultimately be done by the Messiah and by Yahweh. But Lurianic Kabbalah changed that to the idea that the Jewish people become their own Messiah. And this was picked up on by Marx and uh, Moses Hess, that it would be the Jewish people who would, Marx said they would create the world government of the Messiah, and Moses Hess said that they would create the Zionist nation of Israel as an act of the Jewish people as their own Messiah and through their own racial instincts. And all of this derives from Lurianic Kabbalah. So it was Lurianic Kabbalah which heightened the what um, E. Michael Jones calls the Jewish revolutionary spirit, uh, really uh, exploded with Luria, who stated that it was the burden of the Jewish people to do those acts which had traditionally been viewed as to be done by the Messiah and by Yahweh. And that's why we saw the emergence of communism and all of the uh, revolutions and destruction of the monarchy, uh, which was manifest through the Jewish people and not through the Messiah and not through Yahweh. And Lurianic Kabbalah was in the 1600s. Did that lead to Zabatai's B? Okay, oh yeah. Shabbatai Tsevi in the 1600s, uh, Luria Kabbalah was 15th, and it's interesting, uh, Isaac Luria viewed himself as being Moshiach ben Yosef. And this he is the... thought that he... Sorry. He thought that he was the one who would lead the Jewish people to accomplish these goals of restoring the Jews to Palestine through Tikkun Olam. And this is what, um, this is after Maimonides, correct? Maimonides was the 1200s. Much yes. after. Yes. So it's Maimonides, Luriana Kabbalah. This is who influences modern day Chabad Lubavitch, which Kush, Kushner is a member of, and Ivanka. Absolutely. Um, Schnorr Salman, the founder of Chabad, was heavily influenced by Luriana Kabbalah and by Shabbatayan Kabbalah. Shabbatai Tzevi had his own Kabbalah. Jacob Frank had his own Kabbalah. 
Baruch Yah Russo had his own Kabbalah. And each of these believed in the Jewish concept of Gigul, G-I-L, G-U-L, which is their belief in metempsychosis, uh, reincarnation. And they believe that um, Jacob Frank and Baruch Yah Russo were reincarnations of Shabbatai Tzevi. The, the theme of reincarnation is uh, important to understand. And uh, you have Jesus Christ being reincarnated too. You, uh, the Gnostics also believed in reincarnation, and Jesus is to be reincarnated. He was reincarnated after he was crucified. And so we have not only that was the original second coming, but we're slated for another second coming. And we also have the concept of being born again in Christianity. And much of Christianity derives from Buddhism. And there are scholars who believe, well, initially, Helena P. Blavatsky said that Christianity uh, derived from Buddhism. And it was then shown that the Greek in which the uh, New Testament was written also has its own gematria. And the gematria of uh, the Greek passages of the New Testament matches up very well with Buddhism. And the, the names and the gematria in Greek, because in Greek uh, the same symbols are used for numbers and letters as is the case in Hebrew. And Pythagoras uh, initiated the whole concept of gematria. There are scholars who believe that the um, New Testament is in some sense a gematriac uh, formulation of Buddhism. And it very much holds to the idea of reincarnation. The very idea that your soul uh, goes up into heaven is a concept of reincarnation, that you live again after you die. Very interesting. So I saw a couple questions come in, and then we'll uh, we'll end it with those and, and wrap it up. <clears throat> First one they asked. If I can, I'd like to make a pitch for help, because I'm in terrible financial situation, which was generated by this Amazon uh, mm-hmm. banning on me, put me in a horrible situation. And I would like to get all of my books back up, but it's a very difficult process. I'm trying to uh, write second editions, which are enlarged, revised, and illustrated because I am obliged to charge more for my books than I could do on Amazon to receive any money whatsoever as profits. So I'm trying to improve the books as I do it, and I need time to do that. It's a very time-intensive process, but I think it's a very worthwhile process. And if anyone can contribute and donate, uh, it will definitely accelerate that process and enable me to fulfill it. Your links are all down below for your bit shoot and your website <clears throat> where you can pick up the books. The books That was going to be one of the questions. They were asking where they could get your books uh, in print. And uh, and I hope you up a PayPal donation link. I hate to ask for money, but I really need it at this time, and it will be tremendously helpful. I've been putting out free material for almost 20 years now, and um, it's come back to bite me, and this, this Amazon hit hit me hard, and I'd like to get my books back up. They follow everything I do. They stalk me all over the Internet. They lodge complaints against me, and they do everything they can to get my work taken down and censored. And eventually, I'm going to have to put it all up for free, which I would love to do. But uh, in the meantime, uh, in order to get these books back up again for sale, it would certainly help if people would donate. And if there's a PayPal link in the description, I'd greatly appreciate it. Thank you. And I, I made sure I was, I was uh, suspicious, not suspicious. I was expecting that you would be censored. So I picked up not just the Kindles, which I prefer to read, but all of these big books, highly sourced, tons of old Zionist writings in here that could be lost to history. So I wanted to get these uh, in print so they couldn't be burned in the Kindle, the book burnings. <clears throat> and then it burned makes... in Moloch's furnace Kindle. Moloch's furnace. And you can you can get volume one again if it's still up, if it hasn't been censored. The uh, one, the PDF version was censored before 24 hours had expired. I put it up yesterday and I got a letter this morning saying that it had been censored. Pathetic. It's awful. Uh, the last question was, it's, what, it's what can people do? It's a violation of the human rights. It's a violation of the audience's right, the public's right to know what I have to say. 
It's horrendous. It's tyrannical. It's, Absolutely. It, it violates every foundational principle of the United States of America and of Western civilization. Well, it's part of the Noahide laws is they're going to have to shut down anybody that, that opposes their Zionist agenda, and they're trying to make anti-Semitism illegal. They're trying to push this definition of anti-Semitism everywhere. It'll be in, they're trying to bring it to America, just like in Europe, that you could go to prison for, quote, inciting racial hatred, exposing their beliefs. It, you're known as a pursuer in the Talmud, where they can ju- they're justified in killing you to not spread awareness about their supremacist, genocidal doctrines. Yes, it is enslavement, and it is enslavement that is slated to lead to our genocide. And I am one of the few people that understands it. I am one of a fewer number of people who's willing to go public and explain it. I pay a terrible price for doing that, and I would certainly appreciate people's help so that I can continue. Got to support independent media, guys, independent voices. They are trying everything they can to suppress independent thought and and shut us down. And the last uh, question... They're uh, enslaving us. Uh, The Noahide laws are absolutely the process of enslaving us. And it states in the Talmud that they are entitled to 2,800 Gentile slaves in the end times. And they believe that the 6,000 years has expired and these are the end times. So they have the right, not only the right, but the duty to enslave us. And that's what they're doing to me when they ban my books. They are treating me as though I have no human rights and I am their slave. And it's their commandment in the end times that they have to destroy, completely blot out the remembrance, the memory of Amalek, who they consider Esau and this epitome of evil that we're talking about. Anybody that doesn't want to worship them, to worship them, join their circle of peace, honor them as God's chosen people, do whatever they say, be their devoted servants, or you are Amalek. So we're going to start a hashtag, Amalek Rising. The last question, Chris, was what, what, can, uh, what can we do to try to halt this uh, catastrophic agenda? I think we have to get very political, and we have to uh, stop uh, becoming slaves of the two-party system in America and the political parties around the world who are beholden to Israel. Donald Trump gave the keys to our White House to our arch enemy, Benjamin Netanyahu. So our government is subverted. So we have to take political action and become politically active and stop falling into the trap of supporting the lesser of two evils and instead provide the public with the choice of a candidate who represents our best interests and honors the Constitution and honors the fundamental of the founding of our nation and the principles of Western civilization. So we have to get to work and become play active. I don't see any other solution because if it's into revolution and civil war, uh, what will happen is that we will start killing one another, which has been a communist plan from the 1920s. The communists wanted to create in the southeastern United States, a Negro Soviet Republic, and they wrote books about that, and they wanted to balkanize the United States and create Soviet republics out of the United States, and they have duped the white nationalists and the black nationalists into fulfilling this communist plan of balkanizing the United States. And if they succeed in that, the Chinese and Russian communists will have a very easy time in uh, taking control of those forces and pitting us against one another perpetually. Communism is a permanent process of revolution and war. Trotsky, uh, Parvis, and Marx all stated that the communist revolution is permanent. So they will permanently pit blacks and whites against one another, balkanize the United States, and have us at each other's throats until we so weaken one another that the Chinese and Russians will have a very easy time um, invading the United States of America and exterminating us. And this was stated in books. 
all of the black riots were sponsored by communists. Antifa is a communist organization from its inception, and it morphed into the uh, anti-fascist Jewish committee of the Soviet Union and then became Antifa again on the shores of America. BLM is a manifestation of the several books which were written by communist Jews in the 20s and 30s, which advocated for black rights and for the idea that blacks should segregate, not integrate, from whites and form what they expressly called the Negro Soviet Republic in the southeastern United States with Atlanta as its capital. Atlanta, that's funny. Okay, Chris. Well, I appreciate you coming on. Christopher John Bierkness. All his links are down below to, to pick up his books and find more of his work. Um, everybody give us a comment, thumbs up, share the video, let us know what you think, and uh, check out uh, Bierkness' uh, series about Lurianic Kabbalah as well on his BitChute channel. And that is all. Thanks, everybody, for watching. It's important to understand these supremacist, shocking beliefs that they have in Judaism about Gentiles. It's important that people are aware of how they view the world and how they view us. Thank you so much for helping to spread that word, Adam. It's, uh, it's vitally important. Our survival is threatened. We face existential mortal threats, and uh, we need to take it seriously. We need to not only understand all of this, but we need to become politically active to save ourselves and to save humanity from this ancient quest to destroy us. And the facts are all there. I can back it all up with heavy documentation. That's right. We always do. Too much, too much information to even uh, go through it all. It's really uh, overwhelming. All right, Chris. Thanks, everybody, for watching. We will see you guys again very soon. Take care.